Peace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning as we talk about God's word together, I'd like to spend some time looking at some of the things in the Lord's Prayer. Now just so that we're on the same page when I speak about the Lord's Prayer here, wherever you are right now, Just start saying out loud the words of the Lord's Prayer. I'll give you about five seconds to do that. When you hear the word Lord's Prayer, just say the words out loud that you think are part of that prayer. Now I would imagine that many of you started to say things like, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now if that was you, if you were saying that, own up to it, uh, maybe click on the blue thumbs up button on, on, your, on, your, uh, on your video feed. Own up to it. Because that's not really the prayer that I had in mind when I was referring to the Lord's Prayer this morning. Now, that prayer that goes, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray when they came to him one day and asked him to teach them how to pray. Sometimes I wonder if maybe we shouldn't call that prayer the disciples' prayer. Now the prayer I want us to look at here this morning that I'm referring to as the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that our Lord Jesus prayed just before he went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he would be arrested. This prayer is is recorded for us by John in his gospel in John chapter 17, and that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in a couple minutes here. This prayer is so important. Because think about what Jesus was going through when he prayed this prayer. He had just had the Last Supper with his disciples. Jesus knew what was coming next. Jesus knew that when he left the upper room and would go to the Garden of Gethsemane, that he would have a little bit of time to pray there, but there he would be arrested. And he knew that after he would be arrested... He would be tortured. And he would be crucified. And as he was being crucified, he would literally suffer the debt of all sinners. Jesus knew all that was, ha- all that was shortly going to take place. As he prayed this prayer in John chapter 17, he was talking to his heavenly Father about the things that were deeply concerning to him. It was kind of his last opportunity before he would be distracted by the torture, the suffering, the crucifixion. So in those last moments before his arrest, what was so important to Jesus? What did he pray for? If you would, please, if you have your Bible in front of you, in John chapter 17, zoom down to verse 11. Verse 11. Jesus prayed, And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one, that they may be one. Jesus was was praying for unity among his disciples. Now again, Jesus realized that he would be leaving them. He realized that as soon as that he left, as soon as he was no longer in their company, Satan would be hard at work trying to scatter them. You know, if you have your Bible open, go, to just, go just a few verses back to some of the final words of chapter 16, just before Jesus prayed this. Look what he said to his disciples. In chapter 16, verse 32, Jesus prayed, Behold, the hour is coming, 
Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. And that happened. When Jesus was arrested as he was being crucified, the disciples were scattered. So now Jesus is praying for a unity among his disciples. And he knew that unity is so important. They would need that unity to encourage each other. They would need that, in, that unity to do the work that he gave them to do. For the previous three years, he had been giving them all this information as he prepared them to do the work to spread the good news that God fulfilled his plan, his promise that the Savior came, the Savior died, and the Savior rose. Later, earlier on in Jesus' ministry, he told his disciples how important getting along with each other would be for the work that they had before them. In John chapter 13, Jesus says, All people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. That kind of love among Jesus' people is so important. It's so important because it helps make Jesus known. You know, doing the work of evangelism is the work that Jesus gave us to do. And having, for, and having all the right, right answers isn't going to lead people to Jesus. Living a perfect life isn't going to lead people to Jesus. But loving one another is a tremendous witness to those around us. The church has oftentimes been compared to a ship. And who would want to get on a ship where the sailors are all fighting and arguing with each other. Just as unity does so much to aid the work of evangelism, disunity can be such a hindrance to evangelism. And disunity, though, as we've all come to know, in one way or another, is so tempting to us sinners. Unity is such a challenge, can be so challenging. If you look back in church history, there have been many examples in church history where people try to build unity in the church because there always has been some fractions. But I cannot think of a time in the history of Christianity where an effort was made to bring unity and it actually had a lasting positive impact. Usually what happens is there's more disunity than there was before. And maybe even there's more fractures in the church than there were before. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible are we told to build unity? But the Bible does tell us to keep unity. Keep the unity that Jesus brings. You know, when I look at how God sees his people, the followers of Jesus, there is unity. Jesus talks in John chapter 10, verse 16, about one flock and one shepherd. Keep the unity. Later on in the epistles, we're told about one faith, one Lord. One baptism. Keep the unity. Wherever we find people who are sorry for their sins, people who believe that Jesus lived and died and rose for the forgiveness of sins, where we find people who know and believe and trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior from sin, there we have Christians. How does this unity play out? Think about how this can play out in our, in our daily lives. 
For examples, let's look back to the life of the Apostle Paul. Remember, Paul wrote 13 of the epistles in the New Testament. One of those epistles that Paul wrote was the epistle to the church in Corinth. Now, that church in Corinth was a church with problems, with a capital P. They were arguing. They were fighting. There were doctrinal issues taking place there. There was greed taking place. That was a church that needed help. But as Paul wrote the letter to the church in Corinth, do you know what he called those folks? Do you know what he, how he referred to those people who had so many problems in their church? Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, which is Paul's like words of greeting or introduction to them. He addresses them by saying, I beg you, brothers and sisters. See how Paul is striving to keep the unity. Keep the unity, even with all the problems going on. Get along with each other. Keep the unity. Or let's take a look at his letter to the Romans. The Romans had a debate going on in their church, too. Their doctrinal debate was about whether or not it was proper to eat meat that had been purchased from a temple where the meat had been sacrificed or the animal had been sacrificed to a pagan god. In response to that controversy among the Christians in Rome, Paul wrote these words, this is in the 15th chapter of Romans, verse 7. Christ accepted you. So you should accept each other, which will bring glory to God. See how Paul is encouraging and keeping the unity that we have as God's people. So how does that unity play out for us? I mentioned earlier how oftentimes the church has been compared to a, a ship. In many sanctuaries, when you look up and you see the, the high vaulted ceiling, it, uh, some will say, they, we call this the, the nave, and with the high vaulted ceiling overhead, it looks like an upside down ship. And the word nave is the Latin word for, for ship. This place where we sit in church is called the nave. And we get the word navy or navel from uh, that, that Latin word. The church is like a ship. And just though like a ship has many different rooms, so also the church has these, these different rooms, which could be like the different groups in the in the. In the worldwide global church be a Baptist room a Lutheran room a Methodist room and there's going to be differences in those rooms and in, there's many things that just have to be done together in those groups because we're sinners and we don't have a perfect view of, of God, under, an understanding of God's word there's going to be differences for example what would happen if this Lutheran preacher were to go into a church that doesn't practice infant baptism? And I went in and said, well, you guys got to get your beer babies baptized. It's going to create some discord and some, some disharmony. But even though there's some differences in these, in these groups, in, these, in, the, in the ship of the church has different rooms, the ship also has some common areas too. And this is where the unity really comes in. The common areas is, first of all, we're all sinners. We're all in the same boat, literally. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No matter which cabin you're in on that ship, you are still a sinner. That is a common deck. We're in it together. And we all need a Savior. Another common deck is the deck of grace. We are all saved, we're all redeemed, we're all forgiven by the same 
Savior, the same blood of Jesus Christ. For unity in the church too, striving to keep the unity, let's follow the example of Paul again right here in our own churches, in our, right, in our own congregation. We're individuals. We're broken sinners. But we've all been saved by the same grace. Let's extend that grace to others. If God can tolerate my mistakes, can't I, ex- can I, can't I extend that same grace to those around me? If God does not demand perfection from me, who am I to demand that perfection from others? If God allows me, with all of my brokenness, all of my idiosyncrasies, to receive the gift of his grace, can't I extend that grace to others too? Keep the unity that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. I want to close with one more a word of encouragement again from the Apostle Paul. This comes again from Paul's letter to the Romans in the 14th chapter verse number 4. Again, keeping in mind how God has accepted you. How God has given you grace. How God has forgiven you more than you could ever forgive someone else more than you are able to forgive anyone else. That is how much God has forgiven you. Now let's hear the words of Paul in Romans chapter 14, verse 4. And I, I chose the translation from the, 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 the New English, for, the New Living Bible. What right do you have to criticize someone else's servants? Only their Lord can decide if they are doing right. And the Lord will make sure that they do right. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.